we have liftoff. Space, so they say, is the final frontier. And historically, wherever humans have explored what they thought was uncharted territory, war and conflict have never been far behind. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And while the last century may be seen as the golden age of space exploration, modern society is almost completely reliant on space technology. Which is why any war up there could have huge consequences back down here. The opening battles of a World War III are likely to be completely silent because they would play out in outer space. Space is pretty much infinite, and technically it starts only 62 miles above our heads. On Earth, that's about the same distance as driving from here at the Royal Observatory in London to Oxford. Space starts here, the Kármán line. Anything above that is quickly becoming a key area for on-Earth conflicts. Roger, lift off and the clock has started. Now, the militarization of space is nothing new. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear. Space warfare can be traced back to 1957, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first ever satellite. The following year, the Americans launched a satellite of their own, Explorer 1. That triggered the Cold War space race, leading to the first man in space in 1961 and the first men on the moon in 1969. But even before these historic achievements, we were testing our most powerful weapons in space, atomic and thermonuclear bombs. Between 1951 and 1958, the US conducted 166 atmospheric tests and the Soviet Union conducted 82. Two treaties signed in the 1960s put a stop to nuclear weapons being tested or placed in space. But it was not the end of space warfare. In the 1970s and early 1980s, the USSR and the US continued to develop space technology, largely focusing on satellites and anti-satellite weapons. More on that later. In 1984, US President Ronald Reagan announced the Strategic Defense Initiative, a missile system that would shield the US from nuclear attack. But the so-called Star Wars program never really went anywhere over fears it could violate the already tenuous pact with the USSR hinging on mutually assured destruction, the guarantee that both sides could destroy each other that helped maintain peace. The 1991 Gulf War could be thought of as the first space war. No, it was not fought in space, but the use of GPS and satellite information was vital in the US driving Iraqi troops out of Kuwait. And since then, the military use of GPS, high-speed communication in the field and spying have all developed significantly thanks to satellites. Then there was Space Force, part of the United States Armed Forces. Its aim is to oversee all things space for the American military, hinting that there is much more to come from space warfare in the future. While it would be fun to talk galactic battle cruisers and Death Stars, future wars in space would actually be all about satellites. Not just our modern military, but our modern world depends on the thousands of satellites that fly above us. They are essential. You probably use them every single day. There are thousands in orbit at any given time, and they help us predict the weather, watch TV, get directions, speak to friends on the phone, they could even be helping you watch this right now. There are multiple different orbits around the Earth that these satellites sit in. First up, you have low Earth orbit. This is where the International Space Station sits and where high resolution satellite imagery is taken from. Medium Earth orbit is vital for GPS, the tech that powers both directions on your phone as well as keeping track of jumbo jet planes. Higher orbits like geostationary, polar and sun synchronous orbits are used for tracking weather and helping telecommunications. All of these are vital to the military. Every modern military, whether it's NATO states or potential adversaries like a China, both depend on space satellites, but also if push came to shove, would try and take that away from the other side. The satellites and the technologies that back them up can become targets themselves. 
which is why NATO included space in its Article 5 principle, which means that any attack to, from or within space can fall under that category um, and trigger the Alliance's response. You have to think of it in terms of a war on Earth that includes space. So you're not going to get a space war that happens by itself. It's going to be something that happens in relation to conflict on Earth as well. For example, most recently Russia has jammed Ukrainian GPS signals used for navigation and mapping. So how could satellites become caught up in a space war? There are two main ways, either cyber attacks or anti-satellite missiles. Shot from Earth, anti-satellite missiles target and destroy satellites in orbit. Simple enough. A lot of countries have anti-satellite capability, but they've only really been used in tests by militaries to destroy their own old, out-of-use satellites. This is not without risks of its own, though. Space debris is extremely dangerous and could take out other satellites or spaceships. It's moving with such speed. It can be the size of your fist, but take out an entire space station because it's moving you know, past the, the speed of a missile. So for example, a piece from the 2007 uh, Chinese anti-satellite test, some pieces of debris are, are still going around the orbits and it meant that the International Space Station, the ISS, had to dodge a piece of debris uh, from that test in 2007 and 2021. The other more likely route a space war could go down is cyber attacks. If you could hack into a satellite, you suddenly have a huge advantage over your enemy. You could cut their GPS, their communication, you could send false information, and you could spy on their every move. And this is probably the closest to Star Wars we get there is also the possibility of satellites spying on or even attacking each other. In recent years, we've been hearing about Russian, Chinese and American satellites um, dancing with each other, really, doing close manoeuvres um, and spying on their communications. If you can grab a satellite to repair it, that also means you can grab another nation's satellite. So what we call this, it's so-called dual-use technology. And it means that technology can be used for civil purposes, such as the repair or manufacturing of satellites, but it could also mean that you could use it for sort of more dangerous maneuvers. So how would a space war actually pan out? When we were asked to paint a scene of what a opening day of a World War III between the US and a China might look like, it began with a series of moves that took place in the dark, so to speak. That's everything from um, blinding lasers, directed energy, uh, going after the spy satellites, to other satellites coming to life and crashing into key communication node network satellites, to potentially anti-satellite weapons, um, rockets being fired into space, all of which sounds like science fiction, lasers, rockets hitting satellites, but each one of these have been tested. 10 seconds. Of course, it isn't just governments venturing into space. Three, two, one, we are headed to space. Private companies like Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin are taking major steps in the space industry, as well as ferrying their respective billionaire owners into space and back again. But it's Elon Musk's SpaceX who is the clear leader here. SpaceX has major military contracts and works closely with NASA, taking astronauts to the ISS and delivering equipment with rockets. And the company has even had a small taste of space warfare. Payload deploy confirmed. After the start of the Ukraine war, Elon Musk activated SpaceX's Starlink satellite over Ukraine, providing receivers so people could access their internet service. Russia then targeted Starlink in a cyber attack. Satellite warfare is not the only potential type of future conflict. As humans move towards developing bases on the moon and travelling to Mars, it's not very hard to imagine conflicts over territory, the kind of warfare we're all too familiar with here on Earth. 
what does that scramble for resources in outer space look like? Is it completely cooperative or maybe it looks like um, something equivalent to the 15 to 1700s where the European powers equally had this sort of scramble for resources and new world, so to speak, that they'd opened up, which one had a huge consequence to the people that were already there, but also brought conflict back with them. What does that look like, for example, when you've got two different powers or maybe private companies that represent them that each claim some kind of multi-billion or even multi-trillion dollar resource? I think we are still some time away from from how um, that will actually look like. But I think it goes again to, to show that we do need rules and regulations in place for when that technology eventually arrives, because the the kind of division of resources uh, in space is is sure to come up um, at some point in the future, um, and it uh, it depends how how we decide to to govern over that. But perhaps there's also hope for a better future. Space exploration was supposed to be a giant leap for mankind, and not just a place for war. And there remains hope that maybe, just maybe, the new generation of galactic explorers can throw off the shackles of their ancestors, the colonizers, and find peace in the stars. Space and its assets are already implicated in terrestrial warfare. So it's just a question of whether it's going to become a domain for war fighting itself. Most of the science fiction visions of conflict in space, they're not going to happen, at least during your and my lifetime. Politics is the art of the possible. Nothing is set in stone. Nothing is inevitable. But if there is a major war between uh, significant space powers in the future, then it is highly likely that there will be some conflict in space as a result of that. It will be woven into battles at sea, battles on the land, battles in the air. And that's because those systems, whether it's a warship, whether it's a tank, whether it's a commando in the field, they're relying upon networks in space.